It's California edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We're in Sacramento today and we are joined by Senator George Runner. He is a member of the California Board of Equalization. And so I want to speak with you about the budget. Okay. Uh, the governor has issued his proposal, his January proposal. What's your sense? You're a budget wonk. Yeah, it's January budget time right, in Sacramento. Exactly. Um, you know, clearly there's a lot of things that are very different than just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, ca the state has uh, additional revenue right. and in fact if there's been a criticism of his budget so far it's because it's that he has underestimated the revenue right right um, which is pretty typical mm -hmm. the governor always likes to underestimate re revenue that way right. you don't have to spend the first four months of the year talking about how to spend money uh, and then you deal with that right. in, in March or in May when right. the May revise comes but out what's interesting about his budget is he demonstrated a commitment to pay down debt. right he surprisingly indicated he was willing to let the Prop 30 taxes phase out. Right. You know, I'm wondering if he's your favorite Republican governor well, ever. First of all, <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how the legislature, of course, right. we've already had legislators call for the extension of those. Right. Which is interesting because, I mean, we've got, you know, we now have, a, you know, a, a budget there that's $113 billion. It is big. It it's is a huge big. budget. Yeah. And so I don't know how anybody in a straight face would say, oh, we need to continue these taxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, that were temporary. Remember, right. they were temporary to get us out of that out sure. of that problem uh, of of revenue that was down. Right. Well, clearly, that's not the case anymore. And those and those those temporary taxes should be able to be phased out easily, right? Uh, unless unless you really want to see government get bigger but and bigger. Here's the question, and as a tactician, I ask you this: If the legislature wants to continue the Prop 30 taxes, the governor doesn't. How would it get back on the ballot? I, I presume there's not going to be a signature drive to get it back on the ballot, although there could be. There could be, and that's right. the, that is probably one of the big changes uh, with, the, with the last election cycle, right. where, where uh, the majority party lost control with their two-thirds. Right, right. Uh, so you're right. In order to get that done this time now, you would have to go ahead and, um, and, and get um, <coughs> yeah. excuse me, some of the Republicans to go ahead and vote for extending our tax right. increase. Right, but so, couldn't the governor, could the governor, well, I guess if they got two-thirds, then it would be veto-proof. Yeah, and, I, and I, number one, you're not going to see any Republicans. Yeah, I don't, I don't even think it. you're going to see all the Democrats right. in that regard. I, if anything, I think for more revenue, um, I think what you're going to see is this idea of expanding the tax base and I with tax on services. And let's talk about that. Do you know your old friend Bob Hertzberg yeah. is back in the California right. State Senate, right. and he is kicking around a proposal, which, you know, God bless him, it's not that new. I mean, we've heard no, this no, before. No, no, no. And, you know, some Democrats like it, some Republicans like it. And like you said, it spreads out the sales tax. So I th believe the goal would be to decrease the sales tax, but have it apply to services. It could be medical services, legal services, accounting services, gardening services, whatever it may be. What's your sense of that, sir? Well, uh, you know, I, m m I'm always concerned when it is people that are going to spread a new tax to okay. somebody and they say we're going to lower it somewhere else. Uh, I'm always suspicious okay. as to whether or not Fair it's enough. really going to get lowered or whether or not we're just looking for more right. revenue. Um, and, and people have to ask themselves, okay, does this make sense? But for argument's sake, let's say that the proposal truly is to lower the sales tax and spread it out. I know the numbers are, you know, the devil's in the details, but mm -hmm. philosophically, have you taken a position? Oh, I think philosophically, in a, in a, in a, mm -hmm. in a, you can, you can, I mean, again, states are all different. It's not like California, you know, is, is, uh, got the answer and is, right. and is, and is different than all the other states. There's a lot of states that have different kind of right. view as to how they deal with sales tax. You know, there are some states, for instance, who don't charge sales tax on the first $500 worth right. of your clothing that you buy. Right. Uh, we don't charge sales tax on food. Other states do. Right. So, I mean, it's, there's, there are other, there, there's not a perfect system but out there. do you like the this concept? Are you a fan of the concept you know, I, of I, lowering and spreading? I, you know, I, at, at the end of the day, I'm just concerned. I mm. guess the fact is that you have to, you have the question you have got to ask yourself is why? Mm. What are you trying? What, what is the goal that's trying to be accomplished? Mm. If the goal is trying to be accomplished to what? Create a fairer tax system, mm. a broader tax system, or is it really to there to try to raise more money? Mm. Um, and, and again, we just talked about it. California right now has plenty of money. Right. So the idea of changing that tax system. And is it? And how do people feel about that? I mean, a tangible good is a tangible good. When I go out and buy a car, I go out and buy right. something. I get that, and there's a sales tax out. Now, when I go to my dentist, when I go to my accountant, when I go to Disneyland, right. when I go to a movie, 
Right. Um, you know, are there some things that I should be able to just do without having to worry about the tax that's right. going to be charged for that? And you mentioned buying a car. Mm -hmm. And we know that in California, we all are driving our cars a lot. We also know that as a result of what's known as cap and trade, uh -huh. there is a new tax. I, I don't even know what to call well, it. Well, again, it's we a, need to remind everybody, yeah. this is a result of AB 32, mm -hmm. um, actually a bill signed by Governor Schwarzenegger right. um, that uh, created uh, this whole idea of, uh, of carbon credits, right. of the credit mark, credit mark, carbon credit market, and this idea that says somehow we're going to try to figure out how to control carbon right. dioxide um, and, uh, and, and, and create a tax scheme in order to right. do that. And so, you know, the voters were given an opportunity to repeal AB 32. They didn't, uh, for better or for worse. And so now we have this system where uh, fuel yeah, is now and, subject and the to... Problem, yeah, and the problem with the voters oh. being able to repeal it is that it was such a misunderstood issue. I mean, mm. do you think the voters, when they when they voted against it, or when they had a chance right. to vote against it, understood that it was going to affect their fuel prices? You know... It, uh, I don't think yeah, so, because it was never talked about. It's hard to know. I mean, there's no doubt that there was a hugely expensive campaign. Well, there was never talked about right. in regards to that issue. So now, as of January 1st, right. because of the because of the um, uh, responsibility that was given to the, right. to the California Air Resources Board to set these, they've determined that what they're going to do is they're going to measure and, and create a tax based upon the tailpipe effect of, of sure. carbon. And what's, I, I guess for those that oppose this tax, you know, the timing is tricky because gas prices are dropping. And yeah. we were talking before, like, I, I was having difficulty figuring out, has it kicked in, Well, sir? That, you know, we were talking yeah, right. to my office earlier. I said, you know, this the, the, the public input would have, or impact would have been totally different if all of a sudden this pushed gas prices from, right. you know, $4 to $5 exactly. a gallon. if this was a year ago. Right, right, right. and I think that that would be different. Right. But but I think you're right. I think what's happened is it, is the effect is being masked now right. by, the, by the lowering of gas prices. So that doesn't mean that now Californians aren't paying more and than what others are. Give me the statistic you, you well, gave Well, it's interesting. Me. Yeah. Um, because the only way I think that's a fair way to deal with this right. is because the, the, this is often called a hidden tax because right. it's hard to figure out what it is. There's no, there's nothing, there's no stamp on the on, on the pump. Right. There's nothing right. that like says have, this right. is what it is. Right. It's it's just this figure based upon what the market is. And so the figures that we looked at um, is you know a month ago uh, Californians were paying about 32 cents a gallon more than the national average for gasoline, which is. The way it is because because of we our use different kind of mixes right, right. and all the kinds of things that we mm -hmm. do, and that's right. we've always paid more. Okay, so we pay about we paid about thirty two cents more a gallon. Right. Last week right. we paid about forty seven cents more a gallon. Okay. Now, so, if you think about right. that, that's exactly what it is that the carb folks said right. was going to take place. The increase would be between ten and fifteen cents a gallon. So I think they're right. Right. And so as a result of that, right now Californians are paying about 15, 16 cents a gallon more as a result of this, of this, this new, I think it's a right. tax. So your friends in the legislature on the Republican side had tried to repeal this in the last session. It was no, it, it was the Democrat that tried to, who carried the bill. Correct me. But, I believe you. Uh, Do you remember who it was? Uh, it was uh, Perea. Perea. Okay, you're right. It was right. a Perea bill. You're, you're the right. The Democrat tried, okay, tried, fair to, enough. tried to do it and but, couldn't get a hearing right. done. Okay, so where do opponents go from here? Well, I think I think again it's going to be uh, going to be talked about more and more. I think people are going to realize this when they they look around, right. they see what's going to be happening, uh, and they see their gas prices are different than others. And the other right. issue they're going to see because what's going to happen? Remember, gas prices affect the costs of everything. They do they do? So when you deliver business, when you do business, when you buy stuff in right. California, it's going to also reflect this tax. That's a result of that. So again, it's one of those issues where it's once again more expensive to live in California. He is Senator George Runner. He is a member of the California Board of Equalization. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and you're watching California Edition.
This is California Edition. I am Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by John Ashbaugh. He is a council member in the beautiful city of San Luis Obispo, which we know attracts tourists left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And many of the tourists in the 21st century, they're not necessarily interested in staying in hotels. That's right. It's kind of a big move where you've heard of the company Airbnb. It's not a commercial, mm -hmm. but where you'll rent a home or a room for from someone for a week or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. But a lot of cities didn't have regulations on this question no, of uh, these type of uh, home stays. Got, caught us by surprise. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cities like San Francisco, New York, Paris, they've really been hammered by right. what we call vacation rentals, where housing within residential neighborhoods is basically being turned into bed and breakfast neighborhoods right. by people who are basically posting their homes on Airbnb or VRBO or something and attracting people uh, to, to stay there instead of hotels. And in a lot of cases, uh, in the big cities, this is the, the bigger problem, and in San Luis Obispo too, uh, people aren't even there. They don't live there. It's their absentee investors uh. and they've bought into the, the housing there. So the actual working class basic neighborhood character is, is, being, is deteriorating. Uh, and that's a real problem, especially in San Francisco, where prices are so high. Well, guess what? We have the same problem here in San Luis Obispo. Right. We know housing is high in San Luis Obispo. It's considered very desirable. Yeah. And as a vacation uh, location, it's also seen as one that you want to visit. You know, mm -hmm. you have Paso Robles with its wine. Up north, you have the, you know, the, beaches. the, the beaches, the Pismo Beach uh, Outlet Mall. I mean, you got bicycles you know, and bicycles. walking exactly. paths. Exactly. Open and so space. Cal Poly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people come to visit their mm -hmm. uh, son or daughter at Cal Poly mm -hmm. or there are some other visitors. Uh, professors. So you uh, worked with your colleagues on the San Luis Obispo City Council yeah. to pass what I understand may be the first ordinance in the nation yes. addressing homestays? Once again, San Luis Obispo is kind exactly. of plowing new ground. Right. Which, Who you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually familiar ground to us to be out in front, and right. I expect we'll get a lot of cities now who are interested in finding out what we've done. We're distinguishing between a vacation rental, which is a unit that's owned by somebody who may live in you know, Carmel or New York uh -huh. or Wyoming or whatever, uh, from those that are owned by people who live in our city. If you live here and you are an owner-occupant of your home, then we call it a homestay, and we're regulating it as such. Okay. Uh, it's still a short-term rental. It's still a business. You have to get a business license. Uh, that's about 72 bucks right. a year, actually. It's an annual license. And you pay a one-time fee called a homestay permit. We'll have this in place within a few weeks now. Right. And uh, then you'll be required also to pay transient occupancy tax, just like every hotel. Oh, wow. 8% okay. transient occupancy tax. Uh, and it, it's not a huge source of revenue. We've actually had a few dozen of these homes that have been operating this way for most of the last year uh, under a, what we call a suspension of our ordinance because we actually have in place a ban on vacation rentals which used to be defined as any time you rent in any place in your home, whether you live there or not, for less than 30 days. Now, under your ordinance, can the San Luis Obispo resident fail to be occupying the home while someone else is there and still uh, have this ordinance apply? Oh, yeah, they can go do errands. and. So do they don't have to be sleeping at the home? Well, no. At the same I mean, time as the visitor. You know, we had one situation where a longtime operator of one of these homestays uh, told us, uh, you know, occasionally she likes to spend the night at her boyfriend's house. And, mm. is that good? And, and we did have, as a proposal, that we required the owner to be on site between 11 and 6. Mm. And a lot of complaints came in. You know, even Cinderella got until midnight. Yeah, you know, I hear you. People were calling it a curfew or a bed so check. Now it's okay. We eliminated that. Right. We didn't okay. go that way. We said you have to be within a 15-minute drive of the home or a responsible party has to be within a 15 minute drive. Okay. But you have to live in the home. You have to own it and occupy it. His name is John Ashbaugh. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition. It's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We're in Sacramento today, and we are joined by Brian Mainshine. He is a member of the California State Assembly, representing significant portions of San Diego County, and you are now chair. 
of the local government committee. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman. A tremendous honor, and you are a member of the Republican caucus, so the Democratic speaker picked you yeah. to be a Republican chair. How'd yeah. that happen? Yeah, well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate <laughs> sure. it. I, you know, it is a great honor. Uh, and, and I'm grateful to, to Speaker Atkins for appointing me chair of the local government committee. It's something I feel passionate about. Mm. Uh, my background is, is local government, local politics. And am I right that both you and the speaker served on the San Diego City Council at the same time? We did. Yes. Yeah, so we served eight right. years together, uh, formed a really good relationship, a good friendship. We've right. worked together on, on issues, very important, significant issues for a number of years. So I think we have a, right. a level of trust and relationship that, right. that really serves us both well up here in Sacramento. So what does that mean to be chairman? For our viewers that may not know the ins and outs of, of Sacramento and committee structure, what does it mean? Well, it's you know I think it's it's a position that that really does have a, a lot of say in mm -hmm. the subject matter jurisdiction that it covers, you know, and and so you know you you set mm -hmm. the agenda and you chair the meetings, you know certainly you're still having said all that you're you're still one vote, right? And how large is the committee? Uh, the committee has nine people. Okay. Um, so you know I'm I'm still uh, in terms of voting one of nine, but I think you can help sway the agenda. But it, now normally when the majority party makes committees, the majority party will have the majority of members. In each yeah, committee. Yeah. So in your committee, that's different. Oh, it, yeah, it is different. Yeah, that's different. So we don't. We so you know, being in the minor, minority right. party, we're still in the minority party on this committee. Okay. So there's um, still four of you. Actually, it's three, three and six. Three and yeah, six. Yeah. So, so no. you're one of three and <laughs> right. the chair. Right. Oh my. Yeah. Okay. But you know that, that's okay it's because fine. that's what yeah. you know. It is what it is, and, it is and that's the makeup is. of the right. legislature up here in in Sacramento. And I think the key is is you know reaching across the aisle, working with both parties to to try to do the right thing and and get and, good legislation. And one passed. would hope, you know, especially given that in California, all locally elected offices are nonpartisan. Right. That. That committee could operate in a nonpartisan fashion. Absolutely. I, I right. mean, I think it's it's one of the committees. And first off, there really should be a lot more nonpartisan well, work done right. of I mean, to, to begin with. But having said that, this is a, this is a committee that really is is ripe for bipartisan mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And I think to go back to to what you were saying mm -hmm. earlier about Speaker Atkins, mm -hmm. you know, where we formed our relationship was working in a bipartisan manner. And we have eight years of working right. together on that. And we didn't necessarily agree on everything. Which is fine. Which is fine. Mm -hmm. That's okay. She mm -hmm. did a good job representing the district, her city council district in those days. Mm -hmm. And I did a good job representing right. my city council district, which were, mm -hmm. which were different. Were they contiguous, by the way? Uh, the, what's funny is they are now. They are? Oh, okay. Yeah. Parts of our district back back in the old days right. were contiguous. Uh -huh. Now it is contiguous, okay. which is kind of another nice right. thing. Is, sure. Is, you know, we have some, even, even at the level we're at now, we have some issues that affect both of our districts or at least mm. kind of some of the borderline areas you. between us. So what issues are percolating in your committee? There's a number of things that we're going to look at. I think two main ones we're going to take a look at first out of the gate are uh, the TOT issues surrounding right. TOT. Which uh, is the the tax when you go to a hotel, for example. It, exactly. It's, it stands for transient occupancy right. tax. It's what tends to fund uh, a lot of, be, be a significant portion of local government budgets. Mm. For example, in the city of San Diego, it's about 40 percent. So oh. significant portion of it. Okay. Um, and and of course, it, there's a balance. You right. know, it certainly it serves a purpose of of funding, providing services right. to local governments. At the same time, you don't want it to be too high that it discourages people from staying and from coming here on vacation right. and spending their vacation dollars here. So I was recently in our San Luis Obispo bureau speaking with the mayor pro tem of San Luis Obispo, and we discussed that in his city, they recently passed some regulations focused on the Airbnb, yeah. which you've heard. Yeah. So when you rent out your home or house, you know, some cities actually preclude that. Right. So San Luis Obispo is changing that. What's happening cities and or state and, on and, that issue? And that's, that's really a cutting edge mm -hmm. issue because people are trying to decide what should be done. Should it be left to local jurisdictions to mm -hmm. decide that? Should there be a statewide uh, policy on right. that that balances it all out between communities. So I think one thing we're going to look at is what does all of this mean? You know, where sh where should the legislature go on this, or at least have the information available to decide that? What are you hearing? What are your stakeholders saying? We, we've heard all different things on yeah. that, mm -hmm. and I think what what right now is people are a little bit of a wait and see as to what what does this mean? It, it, some of these local jurisdictions are getting ahead of others. Mm. Is that a good thing or not? We don't know yet. So I think one of the things we'll look at is should it be left 
um, on a local level and let each right. one of these jurisdictions, let San Diego decide, let sure. LA decide, and then let some of these smaller, more rural areas decide. So um, all four of our daughters collectively play soccer. Yeah. And a couple nights ago, I was at a soccer game for my eldest, and the field was huge. And I look up, and there's something flying over the field. Yeah. And I turned to a parent, I said, what is that? Yeah. And he said, that's a drone. Yeah. And the other team, I guess a highfalutin team, was filming the game via drone. Wow. wow. It was remarkable. Wow. But it made me think about drones. And, you know, Amazon talked about delivering via drones. In some ways, I think it'd be great. But be that as yeah, it may, yeah. what are you hearing on local government? Well, first off, of that's drones? amazing for a soccer league. <laughs> I'm trying to get my head seventh around that. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. <laughs> right. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> but it was up there flying around. But... Or is that well? Let me ask yeah. you: Is that um, regulated? That that, so that drone flying above the soccer field? Well, it's funny you say that yeah. because that's another thing that we're going to take a look <laughs> right. at: is what are, what are the laws right. surrounding what a drone can do? <laughs> For example, you know, one of the things is can a can a privately we're not now we're not talking obviously military course, or law enforcement, of but but what about a privately right. owned drone? Can they go into? You know, are they they're flying over people's backyards? Right, right. right. Um, they're flying over apparently yeah, exactly. they're flying over girls' soccer. Unbelievable! Room, it was you know, unbelievable. Field. So we're going to uh, look at that right. and because I do think there's areas where certainly where people have an expectation of privacy their backyards right, right? Uh, it, it, some of those areas a soccer field would right. be different well but you know but in, still interestingly there were some parents you know and not to get too parochial but I think it's relevant that we're a little irritated yeah. by it because it could be distracting uh, absolutely. it could be distracting to look a 12 year old girl you know, I didn't even know what it was. It's like the yeah. UFO is coming yeah. down to get us. Well, we know so, from coaching, like do, yeah. uh, that it, it, yeah. any distraction. I was just trying to get them to stop hugging me <laughs> exactly. when I was coaching. You know, exactly. to, so no question, it's a distraction. So, this, the question becomes: Is it a local issue, state issue? or a federal issue exactly. for that matter. And, and in some sense, it's probably all of the above mm -hmm. because certainly, I think when it comes, now there, again, mm -hmm. there is presumably no military purpose for right, them to be right. coach, yeah, right. looking well, at it. Well, with that school, you never know. <laughs> right. I gotta tell you, that was one intense opponent. <laughs> but where do you go with this on this yeah. issue? Yeah, so we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at mm -hmm. there, there does need to be, mm -hmm. in my view, um, some regulation on what mm. these drones can do, where they can fly. You're looking at a safety issue, right. obviously, if they're, you know, flying no, over I mean, a huge sports field. Arguably, what is, if it goes haywire? Exactly. I mean, it could, oh, it could crash Absolutely. right on a kid. and injure somebody. Right. Um, and then we need to look to it, you know, it, it shouldn't be flying into places where people do have an expectation of privacy. We have uh, laws on search warrants right. that we expect well, law enforcement a, yeah, to follow. That's a huge issue. And so, you know, drones drones are going to have to, we're going to have right. to take a look at that now with this new technology, this things that we didn't even envision, you know, a year or two ago. Right. literally. Uh, let alone 20 years ago. Right. So th these are some of the things that we'll look at in our committee, uh, and I'm excited to get to work on it. What else? We've got another minute or so. What else is popping? I mean, are you hearing you know, rumblings about redevelopment, hearing rumblings about you know, incorporation, what are you hearing? I think redevelopment's still a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, we, we've seen ha ha that has done both good things, right. a lot of really good things, you know, certainly coming from San Diego, did a lot of good for, for our downtown. No doubt. But there's certainly other places in the state where it didn't. And so, peep, now that redevelopment's gone, what, what's gonna replace that? What, oh, if anything, is gonna replace that? We, we need to look at that. We even heard last term where there were measures to bring back redevelopment in some form. Right. Could it be for affordable housing? Could it be for uh, homelessness? homelessness? What yeah. I, and you're a homeless yep. expert. So yeah. the governor didn't look at those f proposals favorably. Do you think the time may be riper given that the economy continues to improve, revenues continue to be higher than yeah. expected? I, I think something needs to be done because mm -hmm. redevelopment was certainly a tool mm -hmm. that um, areas that were blighted could be improved. Um, were there abuses? Absolutely. Um, but there's abuses in everything. I mean, and I think does that mean that. you eliminate the program entirely because there are a few abuses? Right. I don't know. That's just me. Yeah. Okay, his name is Brian Thanks, Brad. He is chair of the Local Government Committee in the California State Assembly, of course, a member of that body. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and you are watching California Edition.
Welcome, it's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz in Sacramento today. We are joined by Rocky Chavez. He is a member of the California State Assembly, but he is a rumored candidate for the United States Senate. And I can say that because I've read it. And if you want to affirm or deny, it's up to you. But Mr. Chavez, I understand you may be thinking about running for the seat currently held by Barbara Boxer. That's what I've read in the LA Times. Right, so exactly. It must be true. It must be. So do talk to us about your thought process. You're a Republican member of the California State Assembly, representing San Diego, a Latino man. And so, you know, one could create an argument that maybe this is a viable candidacy. Well, I think the uh, important thing about California is that we have huge issues in education. And when you're mm. talking about education, who's not being taken care of, it's the Latino community. 60% mm. of the young men don't even graduate from high school. Right. And so I think a Republican who's from Los Angeles, right. born and raised in Los Initially. LA, right. Initially, mm -hmm. who can go back and talk to the Latino community about the boards of education and what Republicans offer for solutions that uh, they'll be listened to. There's no question the Republican Party would love to have a Latino voice at the helm. Uh, a couple of years ago, Abel Maldonado, folks thought he may be that voice, but he was arguably chased out for being too moderate. Uh, you are perceived at some level as being somewhat moderate. And so how do you bridge the gap with your own party, uh, yet be able to appeal uh, to a larger electorate in California, which tends to be bluer than redder? I think uh, if you look actually look at the votes that I've taken, the position mm -hmm. I've taken, uh, I'm no taxes, mm -hmm. efficient government, right. responsible government, um, and in support of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Those are Republican positions. Right. But I also believe um, that uh, there's value in diversity of, the, of individuals. Mm -hmm. I support uh, residency. Mm. I think it's important to invest in people. I, uh, well, let's talk about immigration. I care about the environment. Yeah, let's talk about the immigration issue because obviously that's a very significant one. As we speak today, there's a big rift in Washington. Still, uh, members of the Republican Party representing us in D.C. are opposed to President Obama's actions to ease uh, immigration, uh, those that are in this country, giving them some tor uh, type of residency. Where would you stand on that? Well, you know, in 2012, when I recently got elected mm -hmm. on the immigration reform issue on the steps of the Capitol here in San, uh, mm -hmm. Sacramento, I was one of two assembly members of Republicans that said we need to have immigration reform. Mm -hmm. That was 2012. Right. When we took the vote in the fall of 2012, I had convinced 17 assembly members to sign on for immigration right. reform. Right. So this is something I just fell out on yesterday. Right. This right. is something right. I, I strongly You've been believe. On this. I belong mm. believe that there's mm. there's value to a vibrant society, and so uh, when you start talking to Republicans about it, and how you can ensure that we can manage the borders, mm -hmm. notice the word manage. Oh, man, I hear you. Man, manage the borders uh, and respect our laws. There's also a way to be respectful of families because Republicans are about families. Right. So, but okay. So. You continue to speak like what many Californians believe, and but many Californians are just so used to pushing that Democratic lever. And so in a general election, how would you get them to pull the Republican lever? Uh, it would be in 2016, which will be a, a big year, a uh, presidential race, and you know, presidential candidates in the past have not paid attention to California because it has been blue. Well, there's a Republican slice, about 30 percent, 29 percent. Right. There's the decline to state slice, which is about 27, 29 percent. And growing. And growing. And uh, a lot of them, I believe, are Republicans who have left. All right. So you get a good percent of those. Let's right. say you get 70 percent. Right. And then there's that element of the uh, Democratic group, which we are Latino. Right. And, and now you're at 51, 52 percent. And Central and Valley Democrats. That's exactly who right. vote Republican for oh. Jeff Denham and Valadeo. And so... You never know. His name is Rocky Chavez. He is a member of the California State Assembly. Thinking about running for the U.S. Senate, I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition.